from shipping security, uh, illegal fishing, uh, piracy, right up to the upper end of, uh, of geopolitical concerns, uh, including uh, power projection, uh, submarines. Uh, so there's a, a great deal um, uh, that potentially comes within it. That can be uh, sometimes a, an issue in, in terms of uh, maintaining focus in the, in the debate. But um, we've tried to approach that creatively here um, for this session uh, by drawing together a, a mix, both geographically uh, from the region. It is a, a very large region, of course. Uh, we have uh, participants uh, from, from India, uh, from Singapore, from France, and from the United States. Uh, and my apologies for those of you who've seen on the program, there was uh, a speaker from Solomon Islands who unfortunately uh, has been taken ill at short notice and is uh, unable to join us. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we do have a mix both of large state maritime interests, la naval uh, powers, uh, and also small states. Uh, and um, I think that will come out uh, in, the, uh, in the discussions uh, that follow. We have um, uh, an hour and a half for our discussions. I won't delay uh, matters uh, unnecessarily, except just to remind you that for those of you uh, with access to microphones, when you want to uh, speak, please insert your delegate badge uh, into the side, and do remember to take them with you uh, at, the end of the, at the end of the session. We'll, um, we'll proceed in, in, uh, in this order. Um, we'll open with uh, Admiral uh, Dasgupta, who is the uh, chief of the uh, Indian Eastern Fleet to my left. Um, can I ask for presenters, please, to keep smartly to five minutes so that we have maximum time for uh, discussion around the room to follow. Um, Admiral Dasgupta, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon uh, to the session chair, uh, Dr. Ian Graham, distinguished speakers, delegates, guests, ladies and gentlemen. The occasion to share thoughts at the Shangri-La Dialogue is a welcome opportunity, and I begin by thanking the organizers for the invitation to speak at this forum. From codes of conduct, to crisis communication is a worthy subject in these contested times as we gaze into an uncertain future. While my comments would be relevant to the Indo-Pacific region and the maritime theater in particular, they may find general applicability across regions. The primary international code of conduct over the oceans is the United Nations Convention on the Laws of the Sea. There is also the International Regulation for Prevention of Collisions at Sea and the Code for Unplanned Encounters at Sea adopted by the WPNS and the IONS. These concern the maritime domain. Let me start with the UNCLOS. Out of the 195 countries recognized by the United Nations, 168 have ratified the UNCLOS. Another 14 have signed but not ratified it. 15 others have neither signed nor acceded. Countries that have ratified it could conduct themselves in certain ways to protect what they consider to be their primary maritime areas of interest. So while there is general acceptance that it is a workable code of conduct, compliance may vary depending on national interests. We have repeatedly heard about adherence to a rule-based international order. The foundation of such a rules-based order in the maritime environment is the UNCLOS, the purpose of which is to enhance cooperation and reduce chances of fog, friction, and conflict. A rules-based international order can succeed only if there is a shared understanding of the common good. However, there will be disagreements which could perpetuate crises. 
There is hence the need to identify crisis situations that could develop across the world and who the primary stakeholders would be if they do. There could be a range of flashpoints, such as disproportionate show of force, territorial and sea area claims, weapon tests, impedance to free navigation, illegal fishing or exploitation of marine resources, intelligence gathering, narcotics trade, illegal immigration, maritime terrorism, gray zone operations, and extra-regional presence with unclear intent, to name a few. Other crises could erupt in different parts of the world as unintended or secondary fallout of ongoing conflicts, as global interdependence pervades our lives and economies. Having identified these likelihoods, specific confidence-building measures could be formulated by the primary stakeholders. Exchange of critical information at the right time could be an effective measure to reduce risks of miscalculation. Mechanisms that exist for communication during crises range from strategic communications to shape opinion, government-to-government -government interventions at different levels, including diplomatic channels, as well as multilateral forums, military-to-military -military channels, track-to mechanisms, and mediation by acceptable third parties. The onus of creating the best mechanism in a given situation must remain with the parties to a crisis. Such mechanisms must be quick, reliable, and authentic with empowered points of contact. There would be need to lay down norms, procedures, prepared statements, and release of information. In fact, anything that helps reduce risk and miscalculation. In a crisis, dominant powers often expect countries to take sides. This could be counterproductive or even escalatory. At this juncture, I am reminded of a televised interview of the late Mr. Nelson Mandela in New York. When one media person questioned him about his support to certain leaders on human rights, he sharply retorted, and I quote, one of the mistakes which some of our political analysts make is to think that their enemies should be our enemies, unquote. Respect for independent foreign policies and leveraging bilateral or regional dialogue mechanisms to resolve crises would work better due to higher chances of a common understanding of a dispute, geographical closeness, socio-cultural, historical, and other similarities. Enlightened, mature, and timely political direction, as also guidance to field forces and agencies, would be essential to achieve risk mitigation, de-escalation, conflict prevention, or conflict resolution. It is imperative that governments work out crisis communication strategies for conceivable contingencies. Let me close with the words of author James Humes, who said, and I quote, the art of communication is the language of leadership, unquote. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, uh, Admiral Dasgupta, for that um, impeccably timed and well-targeted opening presentation, which brought us right on point to our uh, subject uh, in terms of um, the necessity of crisis communications but also practical uh, uh, pointers as to how they might be made to work, as, as I think only an operator can uh, uh, offer uh, that, that perspective, which um, no doubt we will come back to in, in the question and answer. But um, thank you for, for such a splendid opening. For our next speaker from uh, France, Paris, of course, is a long way from Singapore, but as we had already one reminder from the minister himself uh, in the plenary session, French territory is uh, both left and right of the Indo-Pacific uh, in both oceans. France also has the, uh, both the distinction and the responsibility of, of having the largest uh, exclusive economic zone to police. So I, I don't want to uh, intrude any further on what you might want to say yourself, uh, Ms. Guiton, but uh, we have a, a, a very expert uh, speaker, Alice uh, Guiton, who is the Director General 
International Relations and Strategy from the Ministry of the Armed Forces of France. Mrs. Guiton, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, Dr. Graham, uh, distinguished uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, general officers. I'm particularly pleased, delighted uh, to be able to speak uh, on this very important matter and to share a European perspective, in fact, on a global uh, challenge. Three years ago, our Minister uh, for the Armed Forces presented uh, the French defence strategy in the Indo-Pacific region. And since then, we have made regional partnerships and maritime security the core of our commitment in the area, both from a national but also from a European perspective. And the truth is, sea lanes are really the blood and the nerves of our shared uh, stability and prosperity. The maritime domain is international by essence, no boundaries. It is especially true here in the Indo-Pacific region where the sea lanes provide most of the economic, trade, energetic flows that connect Asian countries, Asian societies together, and Asia with Europe. But this, this big domain, this huge domain, the ocean, is fragile and increasingly a theater, a theater of conflict and tensions. Obviously, the return of great power rivalry has consequences on maritime security. Access to the sea lanes will suffer from the fragilization of our governance system, the erasing of shared norms and good practices. So from our perspective, it is clear that hybrid threats are on the rise in this shared maritime domain. They can be used, they are used, to establish sometimes fait accompli policy or to destabilize regions by reinforcing tensions or damaging people's livelihood. Some actors have normalized use of proxies such as maritime militias and increasingly we know that cyber attacks ta target the shipping industry. These tensions reach the entire water column, if I may say so, including the seabed. And as you know, our Ministry for Foreign Forces in France has adopted recently a seabed strategy with three goals. Freedom of action, protection of underwater installations, protection of industrial and military interests. And we are, of course, willing to share good practices in that respect. We also know that climate change is accelerating very rapidly fragilities of coastal and insular states. Our navies have a role to play to help victims prevent natural disasters from turning into greater crises. And as climate change is putting increasing pressure on biodiversity, collective surveillance of maritime protected areas will be even more important. So how to keep them open and secure? France is trying to do its best in many different ways in favor of maritime security and cooperation. First of all, at national level, as a resident nation of the Indo-Pacific, as it was reminded, we, are in, we intend to protect our sovereign interests, our territories, our EEZ, our two million citizens, and that relies on freedom of navigation and sea-based access. Everywhere the law of the sea allows it, the French Navy ships exert the right of transiting and demonstrating our attachment to freedom of navigation without ambiguity or intent to escalate in any way. Recent deployments have shown France's ability to conduct the whole spectrum of missions of the armed forces in the Indo-Pacific, and they will continue to do so in a sustainable, permanent manner. On a bilateral level, we are also providing naval solutions and sovereignty partnerships to neighboring coastal and insular countries in order to defend their interests and help them contribute to maritime collective security, so be able to do more by themselves. And our deployments also signal our commitment to international law and regional cooperation. Finally, at multilateral level, as a UN Security Council permanent member, we hold the responsibility in ensuring security of global commons because this has to do, obviously, with international law. As a EU member state, France has long pushed for European engagement in the Indo-Pacific and including for the first time on the agenda of the EU uh, the defense of an open and safe maritime environment. Three results. First, coordinated maritime presence, which will be deployed in the northwest of the Indian Ocean. Secondly, enhancing security cooperation in and with Asia program, including projects in maritime security. And finally, Crimario critical maritime routes in the Indian Ocean, which is a program for building capacities, maritime domain awareness, and knowledge. All, all of those are critical if we are to aspire 
to maritime cooperation, and it has been extended to the Pacific region. Finally, we support mechanisms that strengthen governance of the maritime domain and reduce tensions. Those tensions have to be reduced in two ways. First, at political level, and we see that in the South China Sea, the code of conduct could represent a big advance if indeed it respects sovereign interests and uphold the law of the sea. At technical level, by also supporting mechanisms just like the regional fisheries management organizations, fighting illegal, unreported, and unregulated fishing. This effort was notably pledged during the One Ocean Summit organized by France and the UN this February. 那么这个努力的话，是由联合国和法国的话，在二月份开始的这样的一个呃东盟的这个峰会上也进行了讨论。那么很明显的话，我们也关注很多的这个冲突呃线的这样的一个去除，而且非常重要的就是我们呃面临了这些呃这个法律呃海事安全的这些个挑战呢，是我们需要通过多边的行动，然后产生影响。那么这个呃，也是我们集体的这样的一个改变呢，是越来越。And obviously this is our shared responsibility. And my final word would be to say, if we have, to, if we are to uphold freedom of navigation, this is not something related to one region in particular. It has to be done systematically, holistically, everywhere. So it matters in the Baltics, it matters in the Mediterranean Sea, it matters in the Indian Ocean, in the Pacific. This is something that we cannot afford not. To uphold everywhere. Thank you. Uh, thank you, um, Alice Guiton, for uh, for offering a, a different but complementary uh, perspective, one that uh, took us up there at the end to the global systemic level uh, of uh, of the maritime uh, order and the memorable image which you, with which you started that sea lanes are the blood. Um, through which uh, trade and uh, uh, and commerce uh, passes. You you flagged the importance of preserving access. You mentioned uh, that there are threats emerging uh, that uh, include the use of of proxies uh, to assert their interests and create fait accompli. Uh, you also uh, reminded us of the linkage to climate change and the degradation uh, of biodiversity. That of course. Is the subject of an ongoing parallel session uh, in one of the other uh, rooms adjacent to us, but it, it clearly overlaps uh, in the maritime domain as well. Uh, as with Admiral Dasgupta, you, you mentioned the importance of international law as another uh, common theme, uh, and um, reminded us that France is speaking not just from a national perspective, but currently. Uh, at the sunset of your uh, presidency of the of the EU, uh, is offering a, a European perspective, and you uh, included several illustrations of where the EU is uh, practically uh, offering assistance, uh, including the Cromario Initiative. You also mentioned the other point in our title, the Code of Conduct, which no doubt we will be coming back to uh, in the uh, in the question and answer, the Code of Conduct in the South China Sea, that is. Our uh, third speaker is um, uh, a local talent, um, the Chief of Navy, um, uh, Admiral Aaron Bang um, from uh, the Singapore Navy. We're very glad uh, always to have a perspective uh, from Singapore to remind us uh, uh, of where we sit in the middle, literally, of the, of the Indo-Pacific, but also to offer a, a different uh, perspective of scale, if you like, with Singapore sitting at the center of global maritime chains uh, of the type that uh, Ms. Guiton just referred to, but the complete opposite of France in having no EEZ at all. Um, but that's the, the, uh, um, the joy of looking at mar maritime security from uh, opposite ends of the, of the state spectrum. Aaron um, Beng, uh, Rear Admiral, over to you. Uh, thank you, Yuan. It's a great honor for me to be part of this panel to present a bit of a local perspective. I think our chair has been very kind to highlight and illustrate the variety that's on this panel. Uh, he talked about big states and small states. I think we have a civilian perspective and a military perspective. But as a military officer, I thought I'd just uh, explain how I saw the variety of this panel in, from my lens. There's a two-star admiral, there's a three-star admiral, there's a four-star admiral, and there's a ministry official. So in true military fashion, all questions should go to the higher ranking officials <laughs> and not me. 
but I have to do justice to the invitation, so I'll make a few remarks from Singapore's perspective. I couldn't agree more with Ms. Giton, and I think we've heard a lot from the last few days about the challenges that face us across the world, and there's a lot of focus on the maritime domain, because I think that's where there's a lot of boundaries, and that's where a lot of friction plays out. Notwithstanding those challenges, I think we do have to recognise that our region has had some success in promoting good order at sea. And I think this will continue to be critical because many of the challenges we continue to face and many of the flashpoints and areas of tension will be at sea. Um, I think Emma Das Gupta has described some of it, but let me reiterate, I think, what I see as some of the planks that are in place to keep this good order at sea. The first, I think, is international laws and norms, of which I agree the foundational document must be the UN Convention of the Law of the Sea. I think there has been some reinterpretation of it, but I think Singapore's view is the document is very clear in what states can and cannot do. Uh, some of it may be uncomfortable, some of it may feel like it's impinging on states' rights, but it ultimately is a grand bargain, and, uh, and, and we should abide by it. The second plank is uh, codes of conduct. Uh, and these are uh, documents that improve the predictability in our actions and activities at sea. Uh, the most widely proliferated currently is the Code of Unplanned Encounters at Sea used by navies. And the Singapore Navy is particularly proud to have played a role to get all 18 ADMM Plus navies to sign on to queues during our co-chairmanship of the ADMM Plus Experts Working Group on Maritime Security in 2017. The third plank is what we are doing exactly here now, dialogue. Uh, to enhance mutual understanding between our defence establishments, between navies and other maritime stakeholders. And this is important to allow an exchange of views, including on areas of disagreement, and to build mutual consensus. Forums like this are one important part of that uh, plank, but also are forums like uh, ADMM, ADMM Plus, and other forums which include the, practical, uh, the, the practitioners such as uh, Navy forums, such as the International Maritime Security Conference. And the final plank is actual practical actions that build trust and confidence. Um, when I was reflecting on the topic, actually, and I, I, there were two ways I saw we could interpret it, from codes of conduct to crisis comms. One way to interpret it is to say, this is just a list, you know, from, from A to B, a list of things that could help us maintain good order at sea. Another way of, of interpreting it is to say, from codes of conduct to evolve to something higher and something higher order, which is crisis comps. I'm not sure which IISS intended, you can ask the chair later, but I will present a simple view, which is that both these things are needed to ensure peace and stability in the maritime space at sea. Um, and while we might view crisis comms as maybe something of the higher bar, I, I choose to take a more generative and optimistic view that actually we have had some success and perhaps reflecting on what that success is and the elements of that success may pave the way and shine a light as to what we need to go and where we need to go in the future. So let me give three examples of what I think are successes in the region. One is the Malacca Strait Patrol. In this uh, framework, Singapore, Indonesia, Ma Malaysia, and the Thai navies come together. We do combine coordinated patrols, surveillance, and intelligence exchanges to combat sea robbery and piracy in the Straits of Malacca and Singapore. And it's, it's been a success uh, and uh, evident from the fact that the Malacca Straits were delisted from Lloyd's high-risk war zone in 2006. Uh, it was before its time. It's, I think, what we would today term a minilateral, a very operational one, uh, with, some with, with good success. Another example is, uh, comes from the area of operations arising from information fusion and information sharing. So this example comes from our information fusion center in Singapore and involves uh, a tanker called the Orkim Harmony. Um, in 2015, uh, there were, um, this, this vessel was lost from tracking. And what we ended up doing was bringing together uh, the efforts of liaison officers stationed at the center uh, bringing together uh, the, the collective uh, uh, capabilities from, from navies and, and agencies around the region. And eventually what uh, was born out was that an Australian maritime patrol aircraft, while doing surveillance, spotted what looked like the ship, passed the information back, 
uh, the ship was in Vietnamese waters. We then, from the Information Fusion Center, sent the info to the Vietnamese authorities, and the ship was eventually recovered by Vietnamese authorities. So an example of how, you know, agencies, uh, agencies and, and cooperation across uh, uh, different lines managed to achieve success at sea. And the third example is uh, the search from MH370. And we know the story there. Uh, airplane went missing, but very quickly, many countries sprung into action to look, come together and locate the missing aircraft. Naval assets working together with child agencies to optimize aid, uh, information at sea. I purposefully found three examples that were very disparate with underlying frameworks that were very different. The, Marita uh, the Malacca Straits Patrol evolved very traditionally. Ministers coming together, re recognizing a problem, coming to an agreement and tasking the militaries to set up an arrangement, a, a minilateral that we call today. The Orkim Harmony uh, was less traditional in that uh, there was an arrangement of very operational action set up through the Information Fusion Center, ops to ops ex uh, interactions going on day to day, trust and interoperability being built over time, but when something happened, people came together and were able to resolve the, the, the situation. And the last one was MH370, which was really something where there was no underlying framework prior, but a crisis happened and countries came together. But despite their differences, I think there are some similarities in this case, and perhaps these are the things that we want to focus on when we think about how we want to continue to promote cooperation in our region. First, Shared action arises from shared interests. So in my examples, all of them, the countries work together for common objectives of maritime security uh, and good order at sea. And there's an important point here, which is that we don't have to agree on everything, but we can agree on some things, and those areas of agreement can be areas of cooperation in spite of all the other disagreements. Second, we, it is useful to have underlying structures, and if not a formal structure, at least relationships among each other to coordinate and to talk and to understand each other where we are coming from. So the examples of Orkim Harmony and MH370 reinforce the value of this. And because there was some sort of underlying structure or relationship, it allowed the forces to quickly come together, coalesce into a plan of action. And third, that Genuine interoperability helps when we want to spring into action. So this, I think, substantiates uh, the, the massive amount of work that navies and other agencies do on a regular basis to come together to exercise at sea so that uh, we can speak the same language, we can operate safely in close quarters, and we know each other's capabilities when we need to put it to action. So, uh, colleagues, this is what I will leave with you to consider. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Admiral uh, Bangan, for, for accepting our implicit challenge to uh, un unravel the, uh, the the riddle of um, of the title from crisis communications. To, um, I, I won't I presume to offer an answer, but thank you for for, for the challenge. Um, as one would expect from a, a Singapore um, perspective, you have also kept things very real and practical in nature. Uh, by outlining uh, your specific examples of, of how um, uh, maritime uh, issues and crises have been uh, dealt with in the past, either uh, from a sort of top-down government-driven level to more of a bottom-up ad hoc uh, uh, um, arrangement, uh, but observing, I think, the very important uh, point that uh, relationships uh, are obviously central uh, to this. And that's something that uh, seems to be a very common theme, especially when it comes to different uh, modes of, of information um, sharing uh, in the region. Uh, and uh, as you didn't mention the Information Fusion Center here in Singapore, I will, I will um, do it for you if I may. But I think that, that occurs as one uh, uh, locally hosted area where there is um, uh, an underway initiative to uh, promote maritime uh, sharing. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific region, uh, with also um, liaison officers from, from outside countries, including some Latin American and, uh, and, and Europeans. Um, you also mentioned uh, queues, uh, which I think will be familiar to those, to most of you uh, in the room, but for those who it isn't, it's the code for unalerted uh, encounters at sea, uh, which is again very much a, a kind of practical 
uh, rules of the road um, uh, framework uh, to try and uh, uh, have a predictable uh, encounter when ships uh, and, and uh, aircraft in, uh, uh, come into contact with each other, as uh, increasingly happens in this contested and congested um, uh, waters of the, of the Indo-Pacific. Um, our, our fourth speaker um, is uh, uh, the commander of the U.S. Indo-PACOM Command, uh, Admiral uh, John Aquilino. Um, Admiral Aquilino uh, also has a, a very wide uh, remit geographically, uh, the largest uh, of the uh, commands, uh, geographical U.S. commands, uh, over a, a huge swathe of the Indo-Pacific. Um, so, uh, Admiral Aquilino, from your vantage point in Honolulu, but regularly uh, uh, present throughout the region, um, we look forward to your perspective on um, codes of conduct, crisis communications. Uh, Dr. Graham, thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to thank IISS for pulling together this amazing event. Uh, there is quite a distinguished group here today. Uh, I would be remiss if I didn't recognize uh, former Chief of Naval Operations from the United States, Admiral Ruffhead is with us. Good to see you, sir. Uh, I also would like to thank General Ong. Uh, he has pulled together uh, an amazing program here, and we just finished lunch, uh, for your awareness, with 18 Chiefs of Defense. Okay, 18 friends. And we talk about communications. Boy, that's where we need to start, right? That's building uh, confidence and trust and I'm proud to call many of them my friends. Uh, the engagement in the region is critical. Admiral Bing and I have been friends for a number of years. Uh, Admiral Desgupta and I had lunch about a month ago in uh, Delhi. Uh, I haven't had the chance to go to France and spend time with Alice, but I'm happy to meet her today. Uh, but I do spend time with many of our French partners. Uh, Admiral J. Matt, who runs Tahiti, uh, often spends time in my headquarters, and we operate together frequently. So the building of trust and partnerships, and I think that'll play out as we talk about crisis and communications. So uh, the security landscape as I see it kind of looks like this. There's most countries in the region that share a common vision for a free and open Indo-Pacific. And that's free and open without coercion. And where all nations, large and small, have an equal voice to settle disputes peacefully and can thrive under a rules-based order to secure their own interests. Inter internationally recognize agreements and norms and the system we have built together, and that's critical, we have built together through all domains have fostered prosperity and protected the rights and choices of all nations in the region, all nations. But as I stated, I'd like to talk and start with a little bit about the security environment. And today it's being threatened. And as I look at what's going on, I see potentially the most dangerous period, certainly in my 38 years of doing this business, and potentially since World War II. Now, I won't make a bold statement like that without justifying it, or at least telling you what the security environment looks like through my eyes. Let me start with the illegitimate and unprovoked invasion of the Ukraine. The ongoing efforts there and the authoritarian regime is attempting to coerce change through kinetic activity. The PRC's destabilizing actions throughout the Indo-Pacific to include coercion, unsafe intercepts against our allies and partners, failure, failure to respect agreements in the form of Hong Kong, Border disputes, as identified on the Indian border in the line of actual control. 
And lastly, a concern of a declaration of no limits in the relationship between the PRC and the Russians. That's a new world that we have not seen. And lastly, the DPRK's nuclear and missile tests continue to destabilize the region and threaten the livelihood of all nations. So these aggressive behaviors are escalating tensions. They're increasing the potential for miscalculations and hence the topic of crisis communications is completely relevant based on that security environment. We need like-minded nations to stand together and take shared actions to defend this rules-based international order that has served us all so well, so peacefully in this region for over 80 years. Now, the U.S. believes in a rules-based international order based on common efforts to defend the shared principles and all of our vision for the future. And as Secretary Austin stated, we will always stand ready to prevail in conflict, but America's defense will always be rooted in our resolve to prevent conflict. And every action we are taking is designed to prevent conflict. Integrated deterrence is the mechanism, as you've heard. It is the utilization of all forms of national power with the joint force combined with our allies and partners to do precisely that, prevent conflict. Now, the communications as we articulated is extremely important. Great powers should be the models of transparency and communication. And we all have a shared interest in maintaining those open lines of communication. And that's to do one thing, ensure that competition does not veer into conflict or crisis. Now, to set a model for clear and consistent communications, there's constant engagement and dialogue with my partners in the region. And that's, that does not exclude any nation. In November, Indo-Pacific Command hosted an in-person CHADS conference, and all nations were invited. The Indo-Pacific Command hosts a quarterly virtual Chiefs of Defense conference, and all nations have been invited. And I continue to reach out to my partners, friends, and leadership of all nations to enable the communications we're describing and to give ourselves an ability, should miscalculation occur, to quickly de-escalate and prevent conflict. So, none of us should accept changes to the status quo brought about by coercion or force, and instead we should act together to strengthen the rules-based international order that has served us so well. Now, the United States, as articulated by my leadership, will never ask any nation to choose. Those choices are for sovereign nations. That is the reason we have the rules-based international order. But as we look towards the future, there's a free and open Indo-Pacific, or there's an opaque and closed Indo-Pacific where might equals right. And those have to be considered by all nations. And again, I thank all of you for allowing me to participate, and I look forward to your questions.
Uh, thank you, Admiral Aquilino, for a, a clear and sobering e exposition, in which you highlighted uh, some of the uh, uh, of your strategic your goals and how those play out in the in the maritime uh, space. You also um, gave a clear accounting of what you see as the uh, potential uh, disruptions and threats to the prevailing uh, order within the region. And you also uh, nicely kept us on the topic of um, lines of communication and crisis, which I would also note that SecDef um, uh, Lloyd Austin, in his remarks today, also uh, included a line about the importance of keeping open lines of, of communication and guardrails. So perhaps to start things off, Admiral Aquilino, if I could direct one question to you, it would be, uh, given that you have uh, outlined the uh, um, the challenges thrown out by the DPRK, the PRC, uh, and, and Russia, um, and maybe others within the region. In your uh, professional walk of life, um, what do those uh, lines of communication look like? How useful uh, are they uh, in communicating with your counterparts? Uh, who do you consider your counterparts in particular uh, within the, the PLA uh, system? Is there a, a symmetry across there? And if not, uh, are there ways that could be perhaps improved to make sure that you are speaking to the, the right people if um, indeed a crisis merits it? Thanks, Doc. Uh, so the mechaniz mechanism exists uh, specifically through the defense telephone line with the, with the PRC. That's uh, a, form, a formal uh, communication event. Uh, Chairman Milley has used that. I have uh, a hookup as well in the office. Uh, now, for all of the Chiefs of Defense events, we have invited uh, General Lee to participate, but have always offered the ability uh, to send representatives if he would be unable. Uh, for my personal preference, uh, the Southern, Eastern, and Northern Theater Commander, the operational commanders, uh, are the individuals that I would like to be able to build some relationships with and to have an opportunity to communicate. And again, as I said, we're reaching out to do that, and I hope that they will accept. Uh, the DPRK is a little more challenging. Uh, our partners at the Republic of Korea obviously have some direct communications capabilities uh, into that government. Uh, they have not proven to be completely effective, but as you know, uh, we are reaching out in order to continue the dialogue with the DPRK uh, to attempt to prevent those continued uh, provocative and threatening missile launches and certainly the nuclear tests. Uh, we're hoping to prevent any of those from continuing. Uh, thank you for that clear answer. Uh, we now have about 45 minutes for question and, and answer. Um, can you uh, please uh, raise your hand but also make sure that you are um, have your delegate badge inserted uh, into the um, uh, microphone in, in front of you. Um, my eyes are not as good as they used to be, um, but we'll take, we'll take questions uh, in batches. I see Professor Andrew Erickson with his, with his hand up. Uh, I see um, Professor, um, Professor Ian, Ian Chong uh, and Jeffrey or Daniel and Colin Coe. And that's not against anyone else who's got their hand up. I will come to you, but we'll start with that as the first batch of four in the order that I asked. Andrew Erickson. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Erickson from the U.S. Naval War College. Uh, great honor to be here. Uh, question for Admiral Aquilino. Um, during the Cold War, uh, the U.S. and the Soviet Union concluded an ink sea agreement and then further strengthened in, in 1989 with additional uh, wording. Uh, the U.S. and China have no such agreement. Uh, why does it seem that this isn't the case, and what difference might it make if there were such an agreement and it were actually adhered to? Thank you. Sure. So the MMCA is actually the function utilized to discuss operational-level uh, 
engagements of concern. So while it's not as, as, uh, as robust nor has been in, uh, uh, in application as long, that is the mechanism that we have used to discuss those issues. And again, the same mindset is to prevent any future uh, potential mishap or miscalculation. So uh, we continue to use it that way, and we completed a one, I think it was in November. Is the MM, M, MMCA meeting according to a regular uh, schedule, or is it how, how does it work? Uh, we, we had a little bit of, we missed one, I think, for COVID. We did one virtually, uh, but we did the last one in November. So we're attempting to keep it back on schedule, and it's once a year. And you can, we can talk at any time. You don't have to fly to Singapore to talk or ask questions. <laughs> Thank, thank, thank you, Andrew. Um, Ian Chung. Thank you. Um, so I see the gentleman uh, in front of me. Most of you, uh, three, three out of the four speakers are wearing uniforms. Um, I point that out because one of the issues here that, that we see in the, um, in the Pacific area is that we have paramilitaries, um, vessels that are not you know, strictly military, that get into fairly um, tricky, potentially dangerous situations. So. Given your vantage point as uh, uniform military um, and the sort of limitations on what you can look at uh, potentially, how do you intend to address you know, these other paramilitary kinds of challenges that might come up? Thanks. Can I just clarify, Ian, that that question was for the, the three uh, naval well, officers? Well, it's for, it's for on everyone the on the panel because they, they all represent militaries essentially. Okay. Right? Well, in that case, um, I'll go to uh, Ms. Giton. Um, first, uh, and, and um, what would you like to say in response? Excellent, thank you. I think, I mean, there are also additional political answers, and I will have obviously the military answers to my colleagues, but obviously trying to reinforce uh, our partner countries, uh, coastal uh, guards and, and mechanisms, local mechanisms to address the threat posed by paramilitary non-state actors that are meddling with the international law and are trying to uh, indeed uh, counter uh, the free flow of uh, resources in, in many different areas is one way of responding to it. So uh, perhaps from my side, uh, I would say that presence, constant presence from well-trained, uh, well-supported forces, uh, legitimate forces uh, can deter, prevent those paramilitary uh, militias to intervene. And secondly, there is a need for sharing information, sharing intelligence that requires regional cooperation uh, with neighboring countries and obviously with potential support from other countries, partner countries, in order to have the right mechanisms in place, put in place the, the governance that will allow for that kind of exchange of information, and then, of course, raise the political cost of those uh, interventions and being able, if at all possible, to attribute uh, and, and fight against the impunity. So I think there, there is a mix of response, and I suppose partnerships and cooperation can be helpful, especially at local level where there is a lot of ownership. Thank you for the excellent answer. If I can distill your question, uh, Ian, and ask uh, whoever uh, among the three naval, distinguished naval officers on the panel would like to respond, are navies disadvantaged in some way when they have to respond to non-naval threats from uh, paramilitaries or, or militias? To whoever would like to respond. Um, I'll start, but I, I'll, I'll actually answer, perhaps I'll make some points closer to Ian's uh, original formulation, because you asked. I think we, I make some observations. Um, first is, I think Ian is correct, uh, that uh, they aren't typically here at these panels. The habits of cooperation and the habits of interaction among what you call paramilitaries, or, or I will call military law enforcement agencies, is not as strong as the Navy's. Um, I don't think that's a point for despair. I think one reason for that is we should look at the genesis of many of these agencies. Many of them are relatively new, or if they are not new, they've recently had roles expanded. So they grew from very domestic-facing agencies, and they took on bigger capabilities, a bigger area of operations, and they grew outward. So as a result, um, the habits, those habits are not yet formed. But you are correct that we are at a bit of an inflection point because the seas are getting more crowded and there is jostling among them. Um, and I think one of the worrying refrains is that some of these agencies will say, um, you know, uh, unclaws or cues even, 
many of these agencies have not signed on to queues is not applicable to me because I take my mandate from domestic law and I see queues as something that con constrains. So I think that perspective is a worrying one because then they go head to head and they see everyone else as an adversary. Um, but I, I chose the word inflection point deliberately to say, yes, uh, it is a, a bit of a tipping point, but I don't think we've tipped yet. Uh, and I think uh, what we have to collectively do is try to mold them closer in the direction of Navy. So I give some examples. Um, one, I made the point earlier that really we should first start with areas where we can agree to cooperate. So the Information Fusion Center in Singapore, we are trying to extend the participation of the liaison officers to include these paramilitary outfits and show them that coming together in a cooperative, collaborative establishment, at least for some things, actually helps them to work better. And we've had some success. So the Philippine Coast Guard is there. Um, I think the Indonesian uh, Coast Guard agency, Bakamla, has indicated interest to send an uh, officer. I think the Vietnamese Coast Guard and the Malaysian Coast Guard. So I think at least, you know, then you have officers that are permanently stationed. They're working on at least some areas and seeing that cooperation works. So I think that helps. I thought the US Coast Guard uh, commandant's presence here was an excellent one. Uh, and we look forward to perhaps the Coast Guard engaging the region more because that would be perhaps the better agency to engage many uh, of these paramilitaries and, and, and start to seed the conversations and catalyze momentum towards a more cooperative stance. So that's my answer. Thank you. Uh, Admiral Aquilino? Yeah, just a couple of quick points. Uh, I think we expect all mariners to operate safely and professionally on the sea. I don't care if it's a gray hole, a white hole, uh, a warship, a fishing vessel. We know how to operate safely. We have rules of the road and we expect those to be adhered to. Uh, if there's a command and control, if some paramilitary organization is operating at the behest of another government or some organization, uh, we need to understand what that looks like and what is the purpose of that power military outfit and what are its intentions. Uh, but I guess I just don't look at it separately. I expect mariners on the sea to operate safely and professionally. We have the rules in place to do that. And I would say uh, that's what we strive for. And to Admiral Bing's point, the communication, the discussion, we know how to do this at sea. Admiral Dasgupta, anything to add? Uh, I would just like to present an Indian perspective. Um, it's a little different uh, in the manner that we uh, look at our interaction between our Indian Navy and the Indian Coast Guard and other um, police and constabulary agencies that uh, are part of the maritime domain. Uh, as far as the Indian uh, maritime forces are concerned, the Indian Coast Guard uh, has got a limited mandate and uh, they look after more the constabulary functions in the territorial seas, uh, the uh, contiguous zone and up to the exclusive economic zone. Uh, in the high seas beyond uh, the uh, econ ex exclusive economic zone, it is purely the Indian Navy's mandate. And uh, the other smaller uh, maritime agencies, such as the Customs, the Marine Police, etc., they operate much closer to the shores. So uh, we have fairly defined geographical areas in which we operate. And if there is a necessity where our roles overlap, uh, there are mechanisms where, um, for example, in coastal security operations, the Navy and the Coast Guard operate together. There are joint operating mechanisms and uh, there is really no uh, confusion as such within the Indian Maritime Forces. Uh, the Coast Guard uh, of the Indian Coast Guard, like the police, are um, have the powers of legal enforcement of uh, national laws uh, out at sea. Uh, up to the uh, territorial waters and for economic offenses, they are legally empowered. Uh, to carry out these uh, apprehensions and uh, legal actions. So uh, we operate in concert, there is no confusion. Excellent, thank you. Now I'll take the two questions from Jeffrey uh, or Daniel and Colin Co together, if I can ask the panelists just to refrain from answering until we've got them both. Jeffrey first, then Colin. 
Oh, thank you. Uh, I'd like to address my question to Admiral Dasgupta. Uh, in 1995, when India ratified the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, it made several declarations, and one of which says that India does not, uh, or, or India understands that UNCLOS, or the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, does not authorize military activities or maneuvers in the exclusive economic zone and continental shelf without the consent of the coastal state. So this is obviously contrary to the position of the United States, and uh, you know, last year, I think, there was a tension between the U.S. and India on, on that when, when the U.S. Navy conducted freedom navigation operations in the Indian Ocean. Uh, so, if I may, uh, I think the Indian interpretation is closer to the Chinese interpretation of international law. So, given the emphasis on rules-based order that we've been hearing since last night, uh, what, how is this disagreement on the rules impacting... U.S.-India maritime cooperation. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Colin. Thank you, Ewan. Uh, first of all, thanks to the panelists for a good presentation. Uh, just last year, we have three submarine incidents, uh, one of which being fatal, leading to the loss of all hands. If I could address this question to all the panelists, is perhaps to ask you to appraise the efficacy of the existing mechanisms that promote underwater safety and whether there are prospects in the region for prevention of mutual interference as well as water space management mechanisms. Thank you. Thank you. So the first question was specifically for Admiral, Admiral Dasgupta. Uh, thank you for that question. Uh, yes, I do remember that uh, this was a concern at uh, one point in time and uh, you know 1995 uh, is a long way back and uh, this is 2022 uh, things are a little different from what it was then and what it is today uh, I think uh, you know the interactions between uh, different uh, countries and navies uh, develop over a period of time and uh, along with the interactions and developments, the trust also increases. Therefore, uh, if a certain uh, Navy were to exercise uh, in international waters in the Indian Ocean region, and we knew about it, there wouldn't be really any cause for concern. But uh, like I mentioned uh, in, in my opening statement, if there is a, uh, a show of force, uh, the intentions of which are unclear, then I think any coastal state would be uh, a little worried. So uh, the current uh, official position on this, I am not um, uh, updated on that. However, I think situations and circumstances have changed from the time uh, you mentioned uh, till 22, which is almost about 27 years down the line. Thank you. Please. Uh, thanks for letting me inject myself since you brought up India-U.S. relations. So uh, for the past uh, I, number of years, the inter integration, interaction, cooperation, coordination, exercising with the U.S. and India to include all the way through the Quad with other nations has expanded drastically. I thank my Indian counterparts, uh, the former CNO Admiral Singh is a good friend of mine, for expanding Malabar. Uh, and including more nations. So uh, there is nothing impacting U.S.-India relations, and they are only expanding, point one. Point two, just so we're clear on freedom of navigation operations that are executed, certainly by the United States. Those are not operations targeted at any nation. Those are operations that are designed to validate the international rules-based order as defined by UNCLOS 1982, and as my good friend articulated, uh, we have communication mechanisms, but let there be no doubt, those are not targeted at nations. That's a misperception that's out there. Those are designed and executed worldwide, to Alice's point. The freedom of navigation on the water space is global. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that. Um, the question about submarine uh, incidents. 
the nature of submarine operations is almost sort of directly in contradiction with the notion of, of transparency. Uh, but nonetheless, there are arrangements in other parts of the world, usually referred to as water space management, that have not been put into place here. But I might invite Admiral Beng to be the first um, on our panel to answer this, because I'm aware that Singapore does have uh, a, a submarine rescue capability of its own, but also a number of bilateral arrangements with other countries in the region. So Admiral Beng uh, would appreciate your perspective on Colin's question. You and I would also point out I'm the smallest submarine operating nation at this table. <laughs> but um, okay, it's, a, it's a very good question. And your specific question was, you know, pointing to the incidents last year, um, is there more that can be done in the area of, I think you used the word submarine operational safety. I think that was the word that Colin used. Um, I'm not fam I'm, I, I know the others that you're referring to, but I'm not uh, fully familiar with the details. Uh, the one that I am familiar with is the one that happened nearby, which is uh, Kiara Nangala, which is a, a very unfortunate incident. Um, that specific incident did not arise because of uh, proximity or poor underwater, uh, a poor deconfliction of space. Uh, there were other reasons for that. So the sub-op safety, what, what we term as submarine operational safety and, and underwater queues would not have directly impacted that incident. Having said that, I think there's a broader point, which is the water space in this region is going to become uh, more challenging. If you look at the specific geography of, uh, of our immediate Southeast Asian region, there are many parts of water which are 70 to 100 meters deep, which is deep, but if you are uh, operating a submarine, it's, that's not a, di a three-dimensional space that's closer to a two-dimensional space. Um, I will be honest to say that we have made some progress among navies to uh, do that body of uh, sub-op safety, but uh, that it's, it's currently limited for exactly uh, what you and said, because uh, submarine operations are, tend to be held very closely and it's, it's in tension uh, with, with uh, more transparency. But I think it is uh, something that, that we should uh, continue to push on. Uh, but specific, uh, if I just uh, make one more point about the Nangala incident, it's, it's unfortunate that it happened. But I thought there's some optimism about what happened thereafter. Uh, first is that the, I think the Indonesian Navy prioritized very much the lives and the safety of its sailors and immediately reached out to friends and partners for help. Uh, even though they had some good capability, I think they wanted to bring maximum capability. And I think the response was really quite overwhelming. Uh, many countries in the region, you know, didn't, there wasn't two questions about what was going on. I think the ships started making their way towards uh, the rescue site as fast as possible before there were even any details about what happened. It was very unfortunate that, you know, ultimately uh, the incident happened too fast that we were not able to get there to save lives, but, but there was very good international support. I thought that's a, a point of optimism. Thanks. Excellent. That's very helpful. Um, would anyone else on the panel like to uh, offer any thoughts on this question for under, under um, submarine operations? And uh, I would. So to Admiral Beng's point, uh, first of all, our hearts uh, go out to the families uh, of those brave sailors on the Indonesian submarine, uh, to include their two-star head of the submarine force, who was a, uh, a colleague and a friend. Uh, what I would say is there are standards that can be adhered to by all the nations with undersea capability, specifically hatch development and the ability uh, for deep submergence rescue vehicles to be able to mate up and potentially save the crew. Those standards are promulgated. Uh, the U.S. Submarine Force does training with our partners and allies and exactly how to do that. So there are ways we can increase uh, the ability to rescue forces. Admiral Bing's point's valid, right? So within about 20 minutes of that notification, Singapore forces sailed, U.S. forces sailed, Japanese forces sailed with the capabilities to identify, locate, and do our best to rescue that crew. It was really impressive uh, when it occurred. So uh, we have the responsibility to take care of uh, mariners at sea, that is also a part of international law, and we all came and rushed uh, to help our service members in peril. 
uh, in this case, unfortunately, uh, we couldn't save them. We continue to work with Indonesia to help not ever let this happen again. Perhaps just very briefly to highlight again the fact that solidarity at sea also exists and can be built on political contacts that are developed between countries. So mechanisms, bilateral agreements do help also get to know each other and make sure that in the event of an incident, obviously, there is assistance provided. Obviously, uh, in most of the cases, the mechanisms do rely also on the, on the practice and, uh, and obviously, Increased activity, interoperability exercises can provide also for the right practices, shared practices that will help in the event of difficulties. Thank you. Uh, given that our first four questions came from men, I will um, extend the privilege to any of our female delegates who would like to ask a question, and not just in the immediate row. If you're on the outside, we do have uh, a mic that can, can run around. Great. I see a, a, number, of, a number of hands. Um, uh, we'll just go around in, in series. I'll get to you all. Um, Lan An from Vietnam, then uh, Ueki Sensei from Japan, uh, and then Dashna uh, Broa, uh, and then um, we'll, we'll continue from there. But those three to begin with. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gay uh, and congratulations for the four panelists for the successful presentation. My questions will go to uh, Admiral Aquilino and D'Agusta, uh, two members of court. So this morning, we listened to the Secretary Austin presentation and learned that one of the uh, efforts of the court submit is to tackle the um, gray zone tactics. Um, I would love to uh, learn more about the IPMDA initiative, if it has any contribution, if any, to the topic that we are discussing in the panel today. Thank you. Um, and then we'll take the sec second question, Ueki san Thank you very much for a very insightful and uh, educational presentation. Um, I have a que questions for Admiral Aquilino, if I may. Um, what, why, we, we are seeing more, more incidents uh, in the air and in the sea of uh, interception by the, uh, the Chinese, and uh, this has caused some concern about the dangers as uh, some of the, the speeches. Um, what, why do you think we are seeing this? What is the intention of the China, do you think, in your assessment, and what could be the remedy or strategy or prescription to stop such a, a behavior? And then just uh, following up uh, quickly on what Ian was saying, um, th this permanent uh, presence of the Coast, U.S. Coast Guard, um, I'm trying to understand how will they be in integrated in uh, um, the multilateral uh, cooperation that you are engaging, and also especially in the gray zone uh, situation. I think it's very important for the Coast Guard in, in, in several situations to respond and then should the, it escalate, uh, then the navies would uh, respond quickly as well. But I'm, I'm a little unsure of, is the integration going to be within the US and then to reach out to other navies and coast guards so that it'll be much more of a sort of a multilateral integration of the navy and the coast guards to take, to take uh, uh, respond to some of the uh, lower intensity, but potentially uh, escalating situation uh, in the region. Thank you. Uh, Dashna. Thank you. Um, thank you, Chair. I have two questions, if I may. My first question is to uh, Admiral Dasgupta. Uh, protecting sea lines of communication is a key mission for, uh, for all navies. Um, more than almost approximately or more than 70 percent of crude oil imports for China transits the Indian Ocean region every year. Given this dependency on slocks and the geographic disadvantage, do you anticipate a more present um, and frequent Chinese Navy in the Indian Ocean region? And if yes, is that a concern for the Indian Navy? And do you see that as a threat to India's maritime interests, particularly against the context of worsening bilateral ties due to continental uh, border tensions? And my second question is in the US, so I would welcome comments from Admiral Aquilino as well. Uh, Malabar exercises have turned into uh, you know, extended to Australia and Japan as well today, and, um, but that was the standalone India-US naval exercise. You, India still has bilateral exercise with Japan and Australia in addition to Malabar. 
but there is no longer a standalone annual naval exercise between India and the United States. Given the trajectory of uh, the maritime partnership between India and the United States, do you think there is space for interest and willingness for perhaps a more uh, standalone exercise between the United States and India? Thank you. Thank you. Um, just to give Admiral Aquilino a pause, um, I'm, <laughs> I might take that first question from you, Dashna, to um, Admiral Dasgupta, the, the role of um, and potential challenge of a Chinese naval presence in the Indian Ocean. How does uh, India respond? Well, uh, China's uh, naval forces uh, have seen an increase in numbers in the past few years, and uh, they continue to grow with uh, larger and more potent ships. And uh, they almost, uh, at the moment, have a permanent presence in the Indian Ocean region uh, as part of their anti-piracy escort forces. Uh, yes, you're right that um, a fair amount of their trade uh, passes through the uh, Malacca Strait. And uh, I will not be surprised that uh, uh, in case uh, there is a requirement, uh, the PLA Navy could send more ships into the Indian Ocean to safeguard their trade in whatever manner they wish to. Um, at the moment, I, I really don't um, see that as a, as a major challenge to the uh, Indian Navy. Yes, it is something to be watched. Because uh, the, the larger the number of forces, extra-regional forces in the Indian Ocean region, uh, India being um, where it is geographically, uh, will have to spend uh, time and effort in monitoring and um, understanding the pattern of operations. And uh, depending on how uh, a situation develops, I think uh, the responses will have to be formulated by the Indian government and the Indian Navy. But uh, so far, we have not uh, had an occasion for concern. Uh, let me also touch upon the uh, Malabar uh, part of the question uh, that you mentioned. Um, yes, Malabar initially was an Indo-US exercise, and it continues to be so. Um, in, uh, and over a period of time, uh, we have found that uh, working in, in a trilateral or a quadrilateral group uh, does two or three uh, important things. One is that uh, it brings more countries together, the kind of interoperability that you uh, are able to exercise uh, at one go. You would have to do four exercises to uh, you know, get that interoperability. It, it also makes um, uh, sense financially. It makes sense uh, in terms of effort that if you were to do uh, three exercises and in place of that you could do one and achieve the same results or uh, even better I would say more the merrier we say in the um, amongst friends so I think um, it's a good format uh, to my mind if there are uh, like-minded nations if there are like-minded navies I think bilateral exercises should move on to trilateral and you know more so that you get better value out of uh, the cooperation I would take that kind of a view. Um, Admiral Aquilino, you had three questions put to you um, from our Vietnamese delegate on a specific initiative to counter grey zone maritime operations on the reasons why China might be stepping up um, intercept, unsafe intercepts uh, and other activities, your thoughts, and then finally on the Malabar um, question and whether there is room for a, a specific bilateral India-US naval exercise. Okay, some belt-fed answers. I'm going to go backwards if it's okay. Sure. Uh, Admiral Dasgupta has got it exactly right. Uh, let me tell you what came out of the Chiefs of Defense Conference in November. We all agreed that we would work towards three things. Number one is increase minilateral and multilateral operations. I think Malabar is a great example of that, and I thanked my counterpart, Admiral Singh, at the time, and the government of India to expand Malabar to the Quad Nations and anyone else who, when we execute, uh, India would like to invite to participate. So more minilateral, more multilateral, the first thing we agreed to. The second thing we agreed to was increased information sharing. And hold that thought because it'll get to the third question on IPMCC uh, 
from the from the pr the very first question. But second, increased information sharing, and number third, we would all investigate investigate the ability to increase the diversity of our force, and take advantage of the talent uh, resident throughout a diverse workforce. Uh, and we had a wonderful presentation from uh, the minister, uh, deputy minister from Japan on women, peace, and security and the implementation of a more diverse workforce. Those three things the chiefs of all the nations in the region agreed to work on. So the question on Malabar goes specifically to point one, which is more increased, minilateral, multilateral. You're seeing it around the region. Uh, my friend General Andika is building Garuda Shield, which will happen in a month. Previously, a U.S.-Indonesia bilateral event will include 14 nations. And that expansion is happening across the region for all the right reasons that Admiral Dasgupta articulated. Okay, uh, let me go back now to the IPMCC question. Uh, so the information sharing was highlighted to target maritime domain awareness. An understanding of what's happening in the battle space around all of our nations is beneficial to my counterparts throughout the region. And we vowed to increase that understanding. So uh, it was announced by my president and the secretary has tasked us to increase that information sharing for maritime domain, domain awareness with our allies, partners, and friends. And then the last question, uh, if you're gonna ask me why someone else is doing something, I'm just gonna ask you to ask them uh, but what I will say is my secretary articulated it in his narrative uh, this morning, and that is that the United States will continue to fly, sail, and operate anywhere international law allows. And our, inter and our partners in the area are doing the same. So the rules-based international order, as articulated by the 1982 UNCLOS, we will continue to operate in all those places. Admiral Dasgupta, you wanted to briefly add something? Uh, just one small addition to uh, what I said about uh, bilateral and multilateral exercises. Uh, Malabar is really not all. Uh, there are several other uh, fields in which we do bilateral exercises with the U.S. Uh, some of them being uh, for HADR, uh, sometimes special operations or Aircraft uh, uh, routinely operate with each other in each other's territory uh, as and when the opportunity permits. So it's not just Malabar, there's a wide range of interactions. Um, thank you. I saw Maria Serbas over in the corner. If we could get a running mic to um, go to Maria first, please. Very much. Can you hear me? Yes, just speak up, but I think we can hear yes. you. So um, my question is to Madame Guiton. And the question, it is related to grey zone tactics. Firstly, around the concept of the appetite comes with the eating uh, in respect of acquiescence uh, in response to incursions of international law. And uh, it does relate to grey zones, but we have also seen, I think, in the Mediterranean, um, some countries take example from what has happened in the South China Sea. Uh, thank, thank. Mike just, just if you could pause before answering, I'll take another question. I, Blake Hertzinger on the other side of the room caught my eye. Blake, if you could keep belt-fed questions, um, will be good as well as belt-fed answers at this stage. You bet. Thank you, Ewan. Um, my question is for Admiral Bang, actually. Um, so. Uh, Singapore operating maybe the most mature information fusion center, as you mentioned, um, in the region. But um, other other participants are also. Is that me? Um, operating similar centers, India with the IFC IOR, um, France has supported development of a, a similar center in Madagascar, um, Sri Lanka has talked about a center, Indonesia has their own, um, Australia is you know, building their own in the Pacific. Is there a point at which you envision that we actually begin kind of approaching uh, diminishing returns by adding more fusion centers? And, and I'm, I apologize, there's a second part of this, I'll make it quick. Um, I've been accused of being direct, so I'll make it into a hypothetical. If you were, say, on a panel with the commander of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command, um, would you, in terms of you know the the U.S. relationship with the Singapore IFC, is that somewhere that you would be interested in uh, more codified engagement uh, with maybe a fleet level um, a representative or a permanent representative from the U.S. Coast Guard, or are you 
uh, generally happy with how that arrangement works. Okay, um, Admiral Beng, you've got a, a minute to think about that while I, I go back to um, Alice Guiton. The question about gray zones, acquiescence, and potential um, uh, parallels in, in the Mediterranean, if I, if I got that correctly. I do my best to answer. Um, as I understand it, in fact, obviously in the Mediterranean Sea, uh, obviously we see also ambiguous uh, behaviors in the maritime domain, uh, and obviously that triggers the need uh, to enhance political dialogue uh, between the countries that are eventually concerned by disputes, including maritime disputes and legal disputes, but also making sure that we avoid, we deter further incursions and that can be done, again, by enhancing presence of our navies and trying to coordinate further. And in that sense, uh, we launched, uh, I think it was one year ago, an initiative together with the, the Greek government, the Cypriot government, and the Italian government uh, to have some kind of a mechanism called Eunomia, uh, with regular exercises, just to make sure that in the contested areas where we see uh, difficulties and some ambiguous uh, behaviors uh, taking place uh, that we can have, make up our own mind, uh, have an autonomy of appreciation of the situation, and raise awareness if there is a need to do so. But in the end, uh, as in other situations, it's absolutely indispensable to make sure that uh, direct uh, bilateral talks between uh, key stakeholders take place. And I believe that in that area, obviously, we have uh, major organizations like NATO, uh, but also the EU, that can play an active role um, in uh, uh, ensuring uh, security, especially in the maritime domain. And perhaps sizing just the opportunity of the uh, having the floor just to address the previous question, but I think indeed mini multilateral exercises are extremely promising, especially because they allow to address interoperability from different angles and different regions. If I look at the north of the Indian Ocean, for instance, for us it will be even more interesting in the future to have coordinated maritime presence of the EU in the Indian Ocean, making sure that we can reach out uh, to countries like India, key partner in that region, but also having potentially uh, countries from the Gulf um, also joining those exercises so that we can develop a shared vision uh, of the situation. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Aaron, um, Admiral Beng, are we approaching the point of diminishing returns on information sharing fusion centers? Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, you, you make a, a, a very correct and current observation that there are more uh, information fusion centers growing. In my mind, theoretically, there could come a point in the future. Theoretically, uh, some there would come a point when there are too many centers and there's diminishing returns. But we are very, very far away from that point. Um, our IFC uh, and, and all the IFCs you mentioned have something called uh, area of, I think it's area of interest, AOI. And right now there's some overlap, but not significant overlap. Uh, in my mind, before we reach the point of diminishing returns, there would be a natural control mechanism because what you're going to find is that navies and countries are not going to have so many officers to dispatch to all the IFCs and some of them will just not even take off. Uh, so that is uh, my, my current sense. But at this point, I think the more establishment of these centres, you mentioned the South Pacific, I think it's currently undercovered, under uh, So I think it's, it's still uh, beneficial. Uh, I'm not sure why uh, the, the genesis of the second question, I'm not, I wonder whether underlying that is to, 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 to hint to the fact that the US is a very big country, very big uh, maritime capabilities and Perhaps there should be more uh, international liaison officers from the U.S. at the IFC and not just the, the one or two. Um, but in reality, uh, while one proxy measure of the, the depth of relationship between the IFC and the partner Navy is the number of liaison officers, uh, how senior they are and how much of the year they are there, that's not the only measure. There are actually three. The ILO is one. The information sharing link is another, and that can happen independent of an ILO. And then the opsend to opsend link, so that allows one op center to call another op center to say, hey, there's something going on, is actually the third. And actually on all these three aspects, we are quite robust. Uh, I think on the US side, I know that uh, the model for the ILO deployment has evolved over time. So sometimes it's part-time, sometimes it's full-time, but I think the, the level of cooperation is in, does in no way diminish the outcome, so we're very satisfied. But of course, more deployment would always help. We might be able to squeeze in a couple more questions if they're very brief. I did see my colleague, William Albert, with his hand up. Thank you very much. So we have the UN Law of the Sea, we have Q's, we have the ASEAN um, South China Sea Agreement. 
We have INCSEs, actually the US, France, UK, South Korea, and Japan all have INCSEs with Russia. We have the MMCA with the US and China. Is there a way to sort of knit all these agreements together so airmen and seamen throughout this region have a common set of special deconfliction methodologies rather than a bunch of overlapping and sometimes not contradictory, but it's almost difficult to knit all these agreements together. And then we have the, um, as we've heard over the past two days, more countries coming into the region, like uh, Germany doing exercises. Uh, is there a way to knit all of this together into one more comprehensive Indo-PAC code of conduct for uh, operations on and over the high seas? Is that for a director of the particular panel? No, no, I think, I, I think that this influences all, yeah, all the panelists. If, okay. if they who, have who, would like, who would like to take a, an answer at that? <laughs> <laughs> I think Admiral Bank, was that you, Admiral Bank, who signed me up for that one? <laughs> he wasn't kidding when he said the questions are going uh, to come to the right. Uh, I guess I'd give you this analogy, right? So the only thing worse than having no strategy is having too much strategy. Uh, I go back to what I said before. The nations who have been operating on the sea, professional mariners and professional uh, operations at sea, is known. Coal regs is foundational and has been used for many, many years. And then there's been discussions on how to adjust. What are we going to call it? How do we have another event, another document? Those operations are executed globally, not regionally. So uh, again, if partner nations believe we, would look, we need another document, then we always listen to our partners and we will work through what that might need to look like. Uh, I would argue Colregs is that document you described. Um, but again, as we work with allies and partners, we're always willing to work towards codification and insurance that we can all operate safely at sea. Uh, Mr. Ruger. Thank you very much, um, Boris Ruger, Munich Security Conference. Question to Alice Cuiton on the European Union and the coordinated maritime presence. Can you give a, um, a more concrete sense of what partners in the Indo-Pacific can expect from Europeans and how soon? And question to Admiral Aquilino. Given, in your words, that this is um, perhaps the most dangerous period since World War II, um, does that lead us to a rethink, um, or does that lead the U.S. to rethink UNCLOS and possible ratification of UNCLOS? Um, Ms. Guiton, you first. Thank you very much. Uh, coordinated maritime presence in the northeast of the Indian Ocean will be an endeavor, uh, firstly, gathering the EU member states that are ready and able to deploy ne assets in this region in a, in a manner that allows both flexibility, so there is no uh, heavy institutionalized uh, mechanism, but also offering the, the possibility to reach out to uh, uh, third parties, third countries, uh, in uh, associated support. Uh, and that means that uh, quite immediately, if there is an appetite, just like we saw, for instance, in the context of Emasu Agenor in the Strait of Hormuz, of other countries uh, ready uh, to uh, participate uh, to that effort, uh, to exert a presence uh, that is both reassuring and prevent escalation, then obviously uh, that will be considered extremely positively by all EU member states. And as part of those key partners, uh, I can uh, figure, at least imagine on a personal basis that it will be extremely interesting uh, for the European Union to have partners like India, South Korea, or uh, also as I, as I was mentioning, a number of Gulf states, but potentially also countries from Eastern Africa at some point uh, looking at uh, this initiative with interest. But flexibility and openness, inclusiveness uh, will be key, and uh, the more we can uh, uh, share the burden of covering that part of the sea and trying to exert a stabilizing force, uh, the best it will be. Uh, Admiral Aquilino, it wouldn't be a maritime panel if there wasn't a question about U.S. ratification of the law of the sea. So I'm glad tradition has been observed and uh, you have the opportunity to answer. Uh, thank you. Um, as, so it, it's truly important, right? So the definition and foundational understanding of international maritime law uh, is and we support and operate in accordance with UNCLOS 1982. 
Admiral Beng articulated it. Uh, I think in the last ASEAN session, they also articulated that uh, that is the foundational document. If you've watched my confirmation hearing uh, or any time I've testified in front of Congress, I continue to advocate for the ratification of UNCLOS. And that brings us perfectly to our uh, allotted uh, time span at 6.30. My apologies to those uh, of you who had your hands up and I didn't get to you. Uh, I'm sorry about that. Uh, it just remains for me to thank my um, four excellent panelists and you for your contributions also uh, in the room. Um, thank you for uh, the, the end of our uh, first day at the Shangri-La um, Dialogue and uh, we look forward to uh, uh, continuing the discussions tomorrow. Thank you. Thank you.